And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, thank you. Thank you, Valerie, for the kind words. I got to tell you, I am always excited when I have a chance to speak to people who, well, first can use the information potentially for themselves, because if I can even motivate you to think deeply about one of the 12 suggestions that I have here today, I think just one of them would uh, be a life changer for, for most investors, particularly young investors, and the younger, the better. But the other thing today is I'm talking to people that are talking to other people. And uh, from my viewpoint, uh, uh, our, our commitment uh, as a foundation is, in fact, uh, focused on helping people of all ages uh, from the newborn child. I've got a grand new um, granddaughter about to be born any minute now. <laughs> And um, and I've got a plan from the from the day she is alive, uh, there will be a plan in place for her that will, uh, with just a few dollars and even just a dollar a day is all it takes uh, to to do something for her, so that she has an honest shot, uh, even if she's not a big wage earner in her life. Uh, to be okay in retirement. So I start from birth, I go to death. By the way, there's responsibilities at death as well, because all of a sudden, uh, what, whatever mess we make with our lives uh, or good things we make with our lives, when we're no longer here, all of that goes to work someplace else. And so we work hard. And I might make one one comment about Valerie's uh, uh, suggestions about our work. While I do underwrite, our foundation does, the, the course at Western Washington University. I don't know how much you know about college professors, but the idea that I would come in and tell them what to teach, uh, no way. I write checks and, th and they put the curriculum together, but there were things I did, I wanted in the curriculum and things that I I, I would not continue writing the checks if we were teaching young people how to make money buying individual stocks. I didn't want any part of that. I wanted to teach the things that we know have worked for virtually everyone who did them over a long period of time. And I wanted to be like a lotto and a few win and most lose. I wanted to be something literally everybody can participate in those winnings. And when we're talking about our kids, we are talking about a reality that they spend, I figure, some 16,000 hours in, 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 in class and studying by the time they get out, get out of college, K through 12, and then on for another four or five years. And how much of that time is being spent on this uh, topic of well, financial literacy or personal finance or simply to, are they going to know what to do with the few extra dollars they have that give them an opportunity to live a, a reasonable retirement? And the fact is, is that since we don't repair the, prepare those people, they then are not ready in many cases to do the right thing from day one in saving for their retirement. And look, we look back to 19, well, in fact, 1964. If you look at, uh, at, at tables that show what has done to, to the, the, uh, the income that we receive in relationship to the inflation that's happened uh, over the last 50 or 100 years, but since 1964, the, the return or the income that we are receiving uh, from, uh, from our work is about the same as the inflation has been. There has, there has not been any real growth of income, but it's simply been barely keeping up with inflation. And now, those of us uh, who had the advantage of pensions, those of us who didn't have to compete with, with people overseas who are willing to work for a lot less than we are, and, and then being left to, uh, told that we're on our own, that they're not going to take care of the money management for us, but we, 
as people who have not been trained to manage money are asked to be uh, the superintendents of money management. And that just, for most people, doesn't cut it if they haven't been educated. The beauty is investing has never been easier. Never. It is more efficient today than it has ever been. That's the good news. The bad news is there's never been so much bad advice. And unfortunately, many of our young people aren't going to know the difference between good advice and bad advice. That's where I think we come in. And it starts with the reality that to know everything about investing is, is virtually impossible. But there is this circle, this imaginary circle within which Everything that's ever happened, every day in the market, every every depression, every recession, every the good times, the bads, the elections and the non-elections, whatever the problems have been and what how they impacted what happened to the market, they're all inside of this circle. And inside there, there are five pieces of pie. The one is what you know you know. And our job as teachers is to expand that piece of pie as best we can. That, that, I think, is what we perceive to be our primary objective. But there's another piece of pie that represents what you know you don't know. And if we think about it, the thing we really want to know is about the future. Can't know about the future. Nobody knows about the future. I don't care how smart you are about, about the past. You cannot know the future but it is part of the process. But then there's another piece that represents what you don't know. You don't know. And this is an interesting situation because the reality, and this is an important piece of pie for, for investors. The reality is that all of us are limited in our knowledge and the kind of thing that will cause bad times to happen and surprises on the downside, bear markets and all, all the money that people lose during a bear market, those typically come from things that people were not expecting. We might today think, well, we weren't expecting the pandemic and we weren't expecting a war in Ukraine. And, and Greenspan back in 2008 even said, he was surprised at what happened in the housing industry and the collapse of the housing prices. He didn't perceive that to be a risk. Well, the one thing you can do to protect against the things you don't know you don't know is to have a lot of diversification. Because anytime you start zeroing in and doing a whole bunch of one thing, you take the risk that something you don't know you don't know is going to come along and bite you. Then there's a piece that represents what you know you know, but you are wrong. And that's called a myth. I mean, that's what I think of it in terms of people will say things like, like oh, stocks are just a gamble, investing in the market. You might as well go to Las Vegas. It's, it's, it's just a racket. There's a bunch of people making money off of me, and I'm not going to make any money. Well, the fact is, that that is absolutely a myth. And yet I understand why people feel like that because other people they might know have in fact done poorly in their investments, but more than likely, and I really mean in probably 99% of the cases, if we could look at them individually, it will turn out that they were doing things that lots of people would say were inappropriate, taking too much risk for too little return if sometimes there's no return, possibly. And then there, this is the one that frustrates me most. I understand the myths. I understand that you can't know stuff and that there's stuff that, that, that will happen that you weren't prepared for. But once you know stuff, once you know stuff and you don't do anything about it, that is the piece of pie that I don't like. And I don't know that as teachers, how much responsibility we have in that regard. But from my viewpoint, our job is to broaden them what they know and, and, and teach them the things 
that are important. And by the way, if you try to teach them too much, they get confused. There are millions of things they could know, but what if we could just boil it down to a few things that are really driving the bus, that are, are really represent maybe even 99% of how much money you will make can be, can be seen in as little as 12 different decisions. And then I don't know how we motivate them, but I think the best shot we got is to educate them. Because if they're going to protect themselves from the crooks and the, and, and, and the con men, uh, if they get an education, that is the best uh, defense I know against bad information. So there we go. We're going to focus as teachers on making them know more and hopefully motivating them to move forward. Warren Buffett says it. He says, to be a success, you only have to do a very few things right in your life so long as you don't do too many things wrong. So when I focus in on these 12 right things to do, which by the way, there's not one of them that Warren Buffett would disagree with, but we focus on that, but we can't ignore the things that are wrong. So I spend a, a, a good part of, of my teaching um, when I have the time to teach or write an article or write a book about the bad things. I, I've got one book. It's free. It's called Get Smart or Get Screwed, How to Select the Best and Get the Most Out of Your Financial Advisor. In that book, there are 80 things I don't like about stockbrokers, okay? And, or let me say it another way. There are 80 things I don't like about depending on people who are commission-based to give you advice. So there's lots of bad things you could know about, but those few things that we, we want you to get right, they're in the book. You all have the book. You can get it as, as a, uh, a PDF download. Yeah, you can go buy it for... 18 or 19 dollars at Amazon, but it's the same stuff that's in the free PDF. And there's also a uh, audio book that that we've created. Both are free. And my thought is this: if you could just find one chapter or one part of one chapter, they are short chapters that you think would help the children, the students, then you can forward the book to them and maybe, just maybe, not only will they read the rest of the book, but maybe their parents will read the book too. Now, I love numbers. As I was mentioning to Valerie earlier, before we got started, math doesn't lie. I mean, I'm in a business of what they call blue sky stories, things that there, there's not necessarily any substance to it. And there, the, at the end of the day, what is not blue sky is the money you get paid in your retirement from the investments you make and the money you leave to others. And what I want our young people to know is that little tiny changes in what they're doing can mean millions of dollars. Now, when you're teaching, you can use different numbers than I use. I happen to use $6,000 as the investment for 40 years here, 6,000 a year for 40 years or $240,000. If you don't think your students are gonna know how to deal with that much, uh, you could do it with $600. You could do it, you could do it with any amount you want. But here's what I want them to see, that the, to begin with, a very reasonable long-term return for investing is about 8% a year. And I'm talking about, I'm not I can't say safe investing, but I can tell you that if you do it in this, what I call a conservative safe way, the worst 40-year return since 1928 has been about a 9% compound rate of return in the equity part of the portfolio, the stock part of the portfolio. Now, when you get older, you're going to have some bonds in your portfolio. So you're not going to get stock market returns, but over a lifetime, a conservative, very conservative strategy 
gives them a very good opportunity for an 8% compound rate of return during that 40-year period. And then we retire. And for 30 years in this assumption, that this math we're doing here, I'm, I'm assuming a 6% rate of, of return in your investments because you're going to take less risk. We still want you to take some risk, but very little. And you're going to pay yourself 4% a year to live on. A lot of academics say that is an amount you can use for planning how much you take out. So if you retire with $100,000, you get to take out $4,000 out of that $100,000 to live on. Now, if you put away this $6,000 a year over the 40 years and you get the 8% compound rate of return, and we know it's not going to be constant 8%, but just for the sake of discussion, let's assume it is for the math of it. What would it be worth at age 65 putting away that $6,000 or $500 a month would be worth about $1.7 million. And then you start living on it. You start taking out that 4% a year over 30 years, they would take out $2.6 million. And then they die. And they leave something to the people, either their heirs, the children, or the charities, more than likely. And in this particular case, if you started with that million seven and you took out 2.8 million, you still have $2.6 million left. So the total return in terms of the math on your 240,000 is the, the combination of the 2.8 million and the 2.6 million, which is 5.457 million. Now, I think that's a whale of a return and the way to get there. That simple 8% and 6% return is to invest in a product that requires to make the investor make that decision one time and never do another thing the rest of their life, literally. And we'll talk about it in just a second. I'm sure you all know what it is, but I'm still going to talk about it for a minute. But here is the magic. And it's the magic of compounding that is in some ways pretty hard to believe. I mean, if I ask high school kids about inflation, if they get the idea of what it is, I say, look, I, I paid five cents a piece for a piece of bubble gum. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. When I started out, it was a penny a piece, a penny a piece. And then I'll ask what they pay for bubble gum. And of course, they're paying maybe 10 cents, maybe 20 cents, depends how it's packaged and what kind of a card comes inside. But that inflation has forced the price of bubblegum up. And then I asked them, if you did that for 2,000 years, how much do you think inflation at, at 3% a year would make that one piece of bubblegum worth? And then we asked for, and then we started, you know, the 1,000, and I pushed them to 10,000, and we eventually get to a million. It's $2.3 trillion billion. It's two, three, followed by, I think it's 23 or 21 or 23 zeros. The impact of inflation over long periods of time. And by the way, when you're a 20-year-old, 21-year-old kid just starting to invest, and you're looking out over investing for probably 70 years, you're talking about the greatest asset you have. And that is the ability compared to me at age 79, the ability to have this money compound for decades. And I want them to see if they could just add an extra half of 1%, if there's any way they could do, do something, I don't want it to be foolish. I don't want it to be risky. I just wanted to be easy that they could do and understand that instead of eight, they'd get eight and a half. Instead of six, they'd get six and a half. And what's going to happen? They're going to end up with more money at retirement. Instead of two or 1.7 million, they're going to end up with about 1.9. Now, that does not seem all that big a deal, all that much difference. 
except then it's going to start continuing to grow a little bit because you're taking money out. But instead of taking out 2.6, you're going to take out two, uh, th you're going to take out uh, 3.2 in income in retirement. And then you're going to leave 3.7 million to others. And when you compare, uh, add together the 3.7 and the 3.2, it's almost $7 million. It is about $1.5 million more. And by the way, what we, what we know, now I don't know how many of your kids are going to go on or not go on to college, but we know from studies that people who are 25 and have got a college degree and of course, but obviously, particularly if they're in the STEM fields, this gets easier. But the average earnings come close to twenty uh, seventy. I'm sorry, sixty some thousand dollars. Now, when I was their age and I came out of college, my starting wage was four hundred and thirty-four dollars a month, and I got along on it. Well, there's the impact of inflation. I mean, instead of having $5,000 income, uh, uh, people are going to have a whale of a, of a lot more. So I don't think it's outrageous to use the $6,000 example, but you can easily build your own tables. I'm just saying this. If we can teach them the simple things that could make that number go up by a half or a percent or a percent and a half or 2%, and believe it or not, we can show easily ways that there's a 3% difference in what you could have had and, and were likely have or what you should have had because of, by the way, it is about their knowledge and their actions, that those are two things that are important because you could know everything you needed to know, but if you don't act the way you know you should act, and this is not a holier-than-thou statement I'm making. As, as Valerie knows, because she's watched some of my presentations, she knows my weakness is not making mistakes as an investor, particularly, we all do, but my mistake is just in eating. I'm celebrating my birth through birthday week. Why would I celebrate for a week? Well, one is my wife has her birthday in the same week, but the other reason is I love to eat. And that love of eating, which I know is not in my best interest, has been greater than my intelligence about how to eat. And, and, and I'm not the only one in the world to have this problem, but it's the same with investing. The experts will say the worst enemy of the investor is themselves. So I'm going to try to show you some ways. Now we start, this is so easy. This is obvious. If I wanted to make somebody an extra million dollars, and that's what I'm looking for on every one of these, is an extra million dollars because you did it. And if I if if I make this decision, spend versus save, of course that's a million dollar decision. Lots of people spend everything they make. Well, you can say that that's because they can't afford to save. But there are people in other societies that make less than the people who can't save who do save because it's part of the tradition. It's what they believe in. Now, I've seen, I used, when I spent time in Mexico, I saw people who believe so, so uh, to such a degree about their religion that they'd go for a walk and they'd be beating themselves and causing themselves to be bloody because they believed in it. And I know we have people, we'd, we'd love to be there and help some young person who's going through the decision, should I smoke or should I not smoke? Well, I know what most of us would say. Even if we were smokers, we'd probably say, do not smoke. Well, this it's the same thing here. And, and we were talking before we got started about this whole process of getting people to save. Like, it's, a, it, it, it's asking people to give up something that is so dear to them. Well, what we need to impress on these young people is that saving is all about spending. Saving is about spending later. 
And if you want to have a life that looks anything like the good stuff you build when you're a worker bee, believe me, you need to save to be able to do that. Unless you can win the lottery or unless you marry a really rich person or unless you come from, the, you know, you just have the luck to be married into the right family. That's luck. Most of the success of people in life in many cases, it's about luck. So our job is to show them, one, how much they need to save and where they need to save. And I think to convince them that, in fact, saving is really about spending. And they, I think they need to understand, let's take it down a level about this million-dollar payoff. All it takes is $100 a month, okay? Now, obviously, to a kid in high school, that's a lot of money. But we know soon after today, it's $100 a month is, is certainly not a lot of money once you get going, once you get your feet on the ground and you're doing something that's productive. And let's say that you did that, $100 a month, and that you earned 8% over 40 years. That's $311,000 at age, call it 65. Then they get a 6% return like we talked about with 4% distri distributions for 30 years, that's 496,000. Then we pass on to others, 540,000. You add the 496 and the 540, and there's how you get a million dollars. Now you can say, well, I didn't get to enjoy it at all. Well, no, it's easy. The day before you die, you spend it all. I mean, it's gonna be one whale of a day we will never forget even though it's the last day. But you got the idea. That million dollars is there. People think it's that it's impossible. No, it is not impossible. And the sooner we get started, the, like I mentioned earlier with my new granddaughter, is I'm getting her started on day one. Look, a dollar a day from birth to age 70. Now, I use seven, it used to use 65, but people aren't going to retire at 65 uh, who are being born today. They're likely going to be working until they're 70. Now, if they learn how to invest and, and, and save as well, obviously, they could retire maybe a lot sooner. But if they did, put away a dollar a day for 70 years at 10%. That's the stock market return, okay? That's what the S&P 500 gets, the average, if you will, of the 500 largest U.S. corporations. It grows to 2.9 million. Now, you want to talk about the importance of investing early? If you just waited 10 years and you started at age 10 instead of at birth, and did a dollar a day, it's 1.1 million. That's $1.8 million difference because of the first 10 years of 365, $3,650 became a difference at age 70 of 1.1, I'm sorry, of, of one, an additional $1.8 million. This is just math. No projections, no promises. If you wait until they're 20, it's 425,000. Now, we can also, by the way, look at the two kids. One is 25 and one is 30. Young people, I'm sorry. 25 and 30. One invests, well, in fact, they both invest $6,000 a year, but one starts five years earlier. And so different during that five-year period, they put away the money and it grows at 8% to be worth about $35,000. So there you are. Let's say you're the one that starts five years earlier and your uh, friend is just getting started and putting the money away. You now have 35,000. They have nothing, but they're about to have something. So that 35,000 set it aside. When I say set it aside, I'm just saying that pretend you set it aside and see what it does because that other person did not have that 35,000. And it turns out that's worth about a million nine at age 65 with, or let's see, excuse me. This is, this is 65 and in retirement, they end up with extra distributions and what they leave to others of $1.9 million. 
If I confused you, I hope you'll watch it again or read the book. Okay, here's number three. And by the way, did I make a case for starting earlier for an extra million bucks? I hope so. Stocks versus bonds. This is the slam dunk of the century. If we look at history, and that's all we have, this information, here's what we know. Bonds are safe one day at a time, mostly safe. Not perfectly safe, but mostly safe. They don't go up and down very much over short periods of time. Stocks go up and down a lot. I mean, they might go up and down 2 3% in a day, in a day. And typically, bonds are going to go up small fractions of a percent uh, under the worst of conditions in a day. So what do we know? We know if we look back to, to 1928, go through the Depression, go through all of the bad times and the good times and the wars and all that stuff, bonds on average made about 5% and stocks made about 10 Now, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of stocks and there are a bunch of different kinds of bonds. We're just looking at the average. And what we know is when you make five or you make 10. That is 10. The difference is 10 half a percent. Remember, we are looking for a half a percent. Well, to go from five to 10 is 10 of those, which in theory suggests that if you could make 10 instead of five, that you would make an extra $10 million over your life. And I know you're not buying that, but it's true. Again, it is nothing but math. You have to look at the pieces because if you retire, for example, putting away money at $6,000 a year from 25 to 65, you have about a $2.6 million retirement at the 10%. You have $725,000 at the... Uh, uh, at the 5%. And now we take distributions and the distributions are $10 million approximately with the uh, equities and 1.1 with the bonds. And then we die and we leave money to others. In the one case, we leave 14.3 million. In the other case, you make you leave about a million. Now there is nothing wrong uh, if you, if you want to live on less and, and have a feeling of complete safety at all times, the bonds are there for people to do that. But it wasn't a $10 million difference. It, it was more than $10 million. It was about $24 million. Here's a fork in the road young people come to. Huge, huge difference. Everything in one stock, find that great stock, find the next what are we talking? We're talking uh, Tesla. We're talking Amazon. We're talking what? Facebook, something that's going to go to the moon. Oh, cryptocurrency. There's one. Put your money in cryptocurrency. Well, I can tell you that everything that goes up a lot in a short period of time, whether there's value in whatever it is or not, you get the feeling it's a place to be. You do. You get the feeling that if I just put my money in there and I want to wait, I'm not sure it's okay. And finally, it goes up high enough. It feels like it's okay. And guess what? It is not. And what do you do? You buy mutual funds. And, if, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into mutual funds. You will with your students. But I mean, you get in a mutual fund, the combination of a whole bunch of money from a whole bunch of people with the professional manager that takes care of it and does the right thing and diversifies over many, many companies. And yes, yes, there's less risk when you have many I owned Enron. I owned Washington Mutual. I owned things that failed, but they were in these funds where there were literally my portfolio and your portfolio too can have 10 to 15,000 companies. And yeah, they, they, they go out of business. In fact, that 10% compound rate of return I talked about earlier, that includes those companies going out of business. So 
What we know is there's less risk. But here's the kicker, and it's a great kicker. With more diversification comes a higher expected long-term return, not lower. Normally, you see when you get less risk, the suggestion is that you're going to get a lower return. But with diversification, it turns out historically, you get a better rate of return. As a matter of fact, there's a study by Dr. Bessenbinder out of the Arizona State University. And the question of this study was, do stocks outperform treasury bills? Treasury bills have about a 3% compound rate of return historically. Stocks, about 10. Have well, you okay there? If you want a laptop, I can give you a laptop. Ah, okay. All right. So, so the question is then, do stocks outperform treasury bills? Well, as I mentioned, from the period of 1928 to 2016, that was the period the, company, the market made 10, but 4% of the companies, one out of 25, made huge returns. General Motors was one of those companies. Huge returns. Ah, oh, and then they went into bankruptcy. But for a long time, they made huge returns. And that was true of a number of those very famous. Enron, huge returns. One of the seventh largest companies, and then no value. But 96% of the companies made on average, these are all the public companies from 1928 or 2028 to 2016, made 3% a year. Over 50% of the companies didn't make any money over the long term. Okay, that happens. Now, what do we know? If you bought them all, you got the 10. If you tried to be a smarty pants and try to pick your favorite 10 because you know something the rest of the market doesn't know, then maybe you do better, maybe you won't. I mean, people do win lotteries, so it's not like nobody wins lotteries. Yeah, some will. But what we're looking to do is to take care, make sure people get a return that will lead them to the outcome they want. Now, the dream outcome is to be wildly rich. That's the lotto. But the other dream that means you have millions because you saved thousands, that is not a big deal. It's just simple math. The question is, how can you access the simple math? And here's a killer. This one is fantastic because this is what the academic community, and by the way, those are the people I trust. You can trust Wall Street, the insurance companies and the brokerage companies and the banks and everything. I don't. You can trust Main Street, your neighbors and your friends and folks at the office. I don't. Or you can trust the academic community, what I call University Street. I do. I can legitimately say I do to the uh, academic community. I don't mean... I don't mean that they're going to tell me what the future of the stock market is. They can't do that. But they can tell us the things where we can control risk. And the one risk that if you can control it leads to higher rates of return, more than a half a percent. I mean, this is important. We're talking about an extra million dollars for investors who buy mutual funds who have low, that have low expenses instead of higher expenses. So we'll talk about how to do that. But I can tell you right now that there are mutual funds that their average expense ratio every year is 1% to 2% a year. Or you can buy mutual funds that have zero expense per year to manage, or one-tenth of 1%, or one-twentieth of 1%. And there's nothing tricky. There's no magic trick. And these mutual funds that, 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 in fact, charge these low expenses, and by the way, they don't charge any expense to buy them. They are free to buy. They are free to sell. 
and the management expenses inside to manage those funds are close to nothing. And those funds literally manage trillions of dollars, trillions. Now, where's the big money made? In the funds that can convince you, no, you should pay us more because we're going to make you more. They don't know they're going to make you more. In fact, the funds I want us to recommend to our students are the funds that, while they're not guaranteed to make more, historically index funds, index funds, passively managed funds, funds that own all of the companies that would consider that are considered large, all of the companies that are considered small, all of the companies that are considered to own growth companies, all of the companies that are considered to hold value companies, they don't try to pick the best. They don't try to second guess the market. They buy the market. And here's what is fascinating. There's a company, Standard & Poor's, that tracks how well all these different kinds of funds do. So these index funds, they try to be the market, not to beat it, to be, they emulate it. They have this teeny tiny fee that comes off the top. I mean, it is teeny tiny, less than, let's say, one-tenth of 1%. As opposed to one or up to two percent. And what we know is from these studies, if you look at 20 year periods and 20 year periods to these young people we're trying to teach, I mean, that's when they're taking, they're just doing baby steps then that first 20 years, but they're building the base. And we'll talk about how important that base is, hopefully, be, before I get done. Those index funds. And that in that benchmark, only 10% of actively managed funds are able to beat the index funds, which means, okay, we got a choice. It's a fork in the road. We can trust the sales pitches that come out of Wall Street about why this uh, Goldman Sachs fund is better than the, uh, the Oppenheimer fund or whatever it might be. But the bottom line is, that that's a sales pitch. It is full of blue sky because they don't know. But the reality is historically, and that's all we have that we can measure, is the past. You can never measure a sales pitch. and But, but it's what they've got. Chrysler has it over Ford. Uh, general, I mean, they all ha have a sales pitch for why they are better than somebody else. Just go to the dealership and listen. How often do they ever tell you, you know, you'd be much better off with a Chevy. Really? You ought to go over there. No, they're going to tell you what they want to sell. That's how they make a living. And I don't fault them for that. That's okay. That's the way the capitalistic system works. Everybody's got a sales force telling a story. But you need to control your story. See, this is the thing. They want your story to look like their sales pitch. They make money. And our young people need to understand that. You are the one to create the story. And index funds are absolutely a, such an easy decision. They give you low expenses. They give you massive diversification. They give you low trading costs inside because they don't trade very often. So here's some numbers. If you look at the last 94 years, short-term government bonds, STGB, very low, low risk, compounded at 3.3% a year over 94 years. And the international government bonds that have longer maturities, therefore they have a little more volatility, their compound rate of return was 5% a year. If you were in long-term government bonds, they made more, 5.6%. But look at their worst year was a loss of 15% versus a loss of 5% versus a loss of two one hundredths of 1%. 
High stability, 3.3. Lower stability, 5.6. $100 over 94 years grows to $2,000 in the, in the T-bills, $10,000 in the intermediate, and $16,000 in long-term government bonds. There is the relationship for risk and return. If you take more risk in most cases, remember I said diversification, that's not true, but in most cases, you make a better rate of return with more risk over the long term. Now, if we look at, and I'm, I'm for the, I know I'm talking too much here and I want to get caught up. I'm going to go to 40 years if I might. Average 40 years, compound rate of return, 4.5, 5.9, and 5.8. Well, that's kind of interesting. It turns out that actually the intermediate term bonds did better as a compound rate of return than the more risky long-term government bonds. Now let's look at equities. I'm going to do this quickly, and you're going to read about it, or you already have read about it in the book. But I think our young people should be taught. Now, this is, this is a reach because we want to keep it simple. We don't want to confuse them. But we're talking about life-changing information. If all you own was an index of the large companies, some growth, some value. The growth, those are the ones that are in favor. Those are the ones people are excited about, like Tesla, NVIDIA. I mean, you could go on and on and list names that young people might know. At the other end of the spectrum are the dogs. Not the, they're not dogs. They're just not very exciting. They make money, most of them. Well, as a matter of fact, many of the technology companies don't make much money. They're planning on it someday. But right now, they're just they're focused on growing. And people are willing to pay a lot for those because the future looks so great. And by the way, when those companies stumble, whoa, they can, they can fall 50, 60, 70% in a matter of a few months if people lose that hope of the great return. But value stocks, you know, they were never very exciting in the first place. But look at this. The same $100 a year in the S&P 500, excuse me, grew to be worth over 900000 10.2% compound rate of return. If you took out the growth, remember the growth companies that were so exciting and so neat to be in? If you got rid of those companies because so many of them don't do well. It turns out those doggy kind of out of uh, out of uh, out of sight companies that people don't get excited about actually ended up making eleven point two percent, or the hundred dollars grew to two million dollars. And if you put the money in small companies, by the way, these big companies are multi-billion dollar companies, maybe companies on average of. Two or three hundred billion dollars in value. Whereas the small companies, public companies, may be worth three billion dollars in value, but they have room to grow. They have a future ahead of them. And historically, those companies as a group compounded at 12.1%. And then if you looked, and some of those were growth and some of those were value. But if we took out all of the growth companies that were small and left just the value ones, their compound rate of return was 13.4 and $100 grew to over $13 million. Now, we're not going to have time to get in it today, but you will be able to get into it. And that is if you get into the articles that we have on our website on combining these different like here's here's a combo. You combine half small cap value and well, and half large cap value. You can see that the compound rate of return was about 12.5%. So it would have been somewhere between the 4.5 and the $13 million. And it wouldn't have had the same volatility. I want to go out to 40 years. I want you to be able to look these kids in the eye and say, look. 
I know how safe those bonds are. I know we love it. We, we, we love it when the things we own don't go down a lot. But those that don't go down a lot, they also don't go up a lot. But stocks have a history of success, particularly for the long run. And the average compound rate of return of the S&P 500, 11, 13.5 for large cap value, 13 for seven for small cap blend, and 16.2 for small cap value. And if you looked at the worst, <laughs> the worst 40 years for the S&P 500, that is the highest quality of all of these equity asset classes. The compound rate of return was 8.9. That's a great rate of return for a lifetime. And that was the worst. So I want you to add some small cap. I'm talking now to you as, as an individual person. You, you may not, you may not want to go this deep with these kids, but for you, I want you to have some small cap in your portfolio. You're looking to look for an extra half of 1%. It's there. I want you to add some value to your portfolio. Looking for an extra one, a half of 1%. It's there. Of course, this does assume you have stocks in your portfolio. Now, I know you can't see all these small numbers. But I want to show you something really interesting. And I'm going to show it to you in big numbers. But these columns, every one of these columns is a combination of the S&P 500. And every time you move to the right 10%, you're adding some small cap value. So with one fund, we can pick up the small premium and the value premium. And we put that together with some amount of S&P 500, these large established companies. And what does that do to returns? And what does it do to risk? Well, I want you to see, here's the S&P 500 from 1970. This is from 1970 through 2021. The S&P 500 compounded at 11% here on the far right. Okay. If you added 10% to that portfolio and have 90% in small cap, I mean, in S&P 500 and 10% in small cap value, you'd have 11.4%. There's four tenths of 1%. Okay. I didn't get you to half of 1%, but I got you to four tenths of 1%. And the worst 12 months for the S&P 500 was 43.3 versus 43.9. That's basically the same thing. In fact, if I could get you to go to 30% in small cap value and 70% in the S&P 500, the long-term compound rate of return was 12.1%. The worst 12 months was a loss of 45% versus 43. When you're down 43% because the market's going through a tough period, do you think you're going to care if it's 43 or 45? But the fact is, is that over a very long period of time, by the way, we have studies going back to 1928, these small, pardon me, small amounts of small cap value make a huge difference, a huge difference. Because remember, a half a percent was huge. 1% was twice of a half a percent, and you're going to be doing other parts. You're going to you're going to be in index funds and not in actively managed. You're going to have low expenses. Not, you're going to do everything right, but this, this is frosting on the cake. Here's one of the worst things you can do. Market timing. Now, I know a lot about market timing. I'm even kind of an expert on market timing. I've studied market timing. And the problem with market timing, what it is, is having some reason why it's time to get out of the market. Well, I can tell you it's always time to get out of the market. If what you're afraid of is losing money, there's always a risk of loss. As a matter of fact, the greatest lift, risk of loss is when you're doing well. The, the greatest opportunity for gain is when the market's down. It's kind of backwards for how we think. But what we know is the people who try to second guess the market, 
make about half as much as the market. Now think about that. You're ending up making more like bond returns instead of stock returns because you thought you could outsmart the market. One bad market timing move where you get out of the market and you go to cash, waiting to get back in when the time is right. How are you going to know when the time is right? Nobody knows. But in the meantime, you're in there, you're punching and you're fighting, you're doing everything you can to, to arm wrestle the market. It's too big to wrestle with, is my experience. They know better than you. Now, if you don't have the ability to accept major amounts of loss along the way, that means you probably need to have some bonds in your portfolio. And that's part of the work we do on our site, is we show people who are do-it-yourself investors, all right, you don't have much risk tolerance, how much do you need in bonds? That's part of another presentation. Dollar cost averaging. I love this. I love the word guaranteed. When you dollar cost average in, your young people need to understand, okay, you're putting $100 a month in there. Every month, it's like a 401k would normally be, be done or a 403b. $100 a month, you're buying those shares. And when the market goes down, guaranteed to buy more. If you were buying shares, $100 of $10 shares, you got 10 shares. And then it goes down to five, you buy 20 shares. Then it goes down to one, you're buying 100 shares. When it goes up, you buy fewer shares. And over time, you will have purchased way more shares at low prices than we likely would ever based on how we feel about it. Because when the market is down, we feel like it's going down forever. So we're afraid of it. Dollar cost averaging said, you're a buy and holder. You just keep going. Now, don't keep going into one stock. But if you're going into an index that has a 100-year, actually, in a way, they also looked at 200-year uh, history of success when you own everything, it is a million-dollar decision, dollar cost averaging. And we know this, God, do we know this, is that you get your money into a tax-deferred or a tax-free investment that, that you are going to come out way more than if you're in, than you have a taxable event investment. And the beauty is today, I didn't have this when I was young, you have access to a Roth. I hope you have access to a Roth. Well, you have an IRA, but you also potentially could, could have a Roth 401k. And here's what I believe. I think this is worth teaching kids. The Roth IRA is no different from the tax deferred IRA that most people are used to, to, to investing in, or like a 401k, where you invest money in the 401k and you get a tax write off, or in an IRA and you get a tax write off and you get a refund from taxes. You get money back because you did that IRA, you did that 401k. You see, if you take that money and you simply reinvest it, you in essence have the same thing as a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. But people don't reinvest mostly in their Roth or their, their IRA or their 401k. They take that money and they enjoy it. And that's wonderful. I understand that. But with the Roth, it tricks you in a way. Because by, by not getting that refund, what you're getting in exchange is tax-free growth for life and tax-free distributions for life. Now, when I said that there's no difference between uh, the two, a, a tax deferred or a tax-free, if you reinvest, if you all of the money you get back. But here's the thing that I think is the big decision that nobody knows, and I'm willing to take a stand because I've been there. It's anecdotal, okay? I came into this industry in the mid-60s. When I came into this industry 
in uh, 1966, and I started investing in 1963. When I came in, well, well, right before I went into the industry, the marginal tax rate was 90%, 90% over a certain number of dollars. If you made over, let's say, maybe $90,000, not $90,000 was a, a, meant a lot more then because inflation inflation hadn't built the value of money up to what it is today. But when you are 70, and if the tax rate is 90% or 70%, it went down to 70%. Today, it's in the mid-30s, basically, for most people. Well, for most people, people don't, most people pay less than 25% in taxes. But to the extent that you're going to have a lot of money, you're taking money out and not paying taxes on it, you might have neighbors that are paying 70% on taxes. You're paying zero. I think it is a risk worth taking. Plus, it forces you, in essence, to have all the money that you put into the Roth IRA, you put into the Roth 401k, have it go to work and stay there growing tax-free. And also, a Roth allows you the ability to not have to take minimum required distributions if you don't want to. Target date funds. Half of my book is about target date funds. I should say our book. Rich Buck has been writing with me for I don't know, 30 years, I think. And uh, Rich is actually a writer. Uh, I'm pretty much a thinker and an editor, but it's a good partnership and we continue to do it even in, in, in retirement. By the way, uh, we have some, some what I'll call heavy hitters in, in our organization that have a lot of experience. And most of the people who, who do the heavy lifting in terms of research and whatnot, they are volunteers. I am a volunteer. I don't get paid a penny. Uh, you will get to know Chris Pedersen and Daryl Balls if you become a regular visitor to our podcast and our videos. These are smart, smart, experienced people trying to help you. They are not being paid a penny. It is because they really want to help you and the people that you're teaching. So target date fund. This is what probably 99% of your students should have, a target date fund. It, what it does, when you, when, when you make your first investment, you basically tell the mutual fund company, I want to retire in 2070. Okay, then we know you're a young person with lots of years to retirement. So we're going we're gonna to take care of your money and expose you to the risk that you should have at age 20, at age 25, eight at 30, 35, 40, 45. They're changing it. They're not, they're not market timing. They're not bouncing in and out for you. They are simply exposing you to the right amount of equity and fixed income. And then when you retire, they keep doing it. If you were in the Vanguard, a target date fund, and you're my age, they have you 30% in equities, 70% in fixed income. If you were your age, 20 with your student's age, they'd have 90% in equity and 10% in fixed income. They are professionally managing these, these funds way better than individuals would do on their own. In fact, Wharton did a very serious study over a long period of time at, over looking at 1.2 million accounts and the advantage to the people who use target date funds is expected to be about 2.3% a year better. And I'm looking for a half a percent. This is, and Valerie, I don't think you've seen this piece. I want to talk about something we need to have our young people understand. They are about to enter into a partnership. This is, this is, I think this is really important. They are not prepared to do all the things and to know all the things that, that they need to know to be 
a successful investor. Having said that, anybody can buy a lottery ticket. I think if you're 21, I suspect. So what happens is this. The young person as an investor takes the important step of investing. And that step is way more important than they understand. They think they're a little peewee person without any importance. And they're going into this great big giant market with a little bit of money. No, it's all they got. And it's a lot of money. They just don't know it yet. It gets to be a lot of money over time. But oftentimes, they want it to happen now. But in the first 10 years, the real heavy lifting is not from the market. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be looking at your returns and say, hey, what's the, what's the problem with you, Mr. Market? You know, I'm doing my part. Why aren't you making me rich? Because young investors oftentimes don't understand. You don't, very few people get rich quickly. It's over time. And it's that money that you put in that carries the day for the first 10 or 20 years. And let me just give you one example. At the end of the first year, you put in, let's say, $1,000. You put in $83.33 a month. You put in $1,000. And let's say it's a year that the market is up 10%. So then you have $1,000 plus you know, 10% of pieces of money that were put in monthly, but it's not going to be $1,100. It's going to be something less. So it's let's say it's worth $1,100 just for the sake of discussion. You, The market made you $100. You put in 1000 You are the most important partner at this point. But later, later, that's different. If, for example, and I've got my grandchild to be uh, thinking about here in the next weeks about how should she have that money invested, I would like her to make 12% on that money instead of 10. And that means small cap value. Or if you looked at the, at the tables, you would see that we have strategies that combine the S&P 500 and small cap value that have made over 12% over the last 52 years. Okay. I just want you to see that that first five years that you put in $6,000 a year or $30,000, it's only worth $42,691. It doesn't seem a lot since you put in 30. Come on, where's the action? At the end of the next 10 years, you keep putting away that $6,000, getting that 12%. Again, we're only talking math here. We're not talking about reality of the market. But at that point, it's up to 117, 118,000. But you put in 60. So still, it doesn't seem for all the money you put in, you're thinking you're supposed to have three or four or five times that amount of money in there. After all, you're in the stock market where people get rich. But by the time you get out there 15 years, now the money you're putting in every year is not as much as what's being made inside that fund. And now you're doing the same thing you were doing 15 years ago, except now you got 250,000. And by the time you do that for 40 years, it's 5 million. And all you did was the same thing over and over. You built in little pieces a real retirement. If you take out the first five years, I know I showed you this earlier. If you take out the first five years, that uh, $5.1 million will be worth $2.9 million. That difference, that difference is the first five years. And the payoff for all of us for getting this education, by the way, how is this different in a way than anything we do as teachers? Now, it's kind of hard to know what the payoff is for learning history. 
For learning math, it's easy to see what the payoff could be. For learning a lot of stuff, uh, I learned how to draw these letters, cursive letters, very carefully. I don't know that that means so much anymore, but that was part of my education. I'd rather that they spent those hours teaching people how to put money aside and, and grow it. By the way, if you do this right, if you get the education, then all it takes you is a few hours a year, literally, because you're not in the business of guessing the future. You're not in the business of controlling the, the world. You're just getting on for the ride. But they will likely, if they get an education, invest earlier, invest more, diversify more, pay less in expenses, own more in equities. We see the impact of that. Pay less in taxes. And here's how you become, this is a bonus. If we educate them well enough, they will never have to go to Wall Street to hire somebody to charge them 1% a year to manage the money for them. Because what young people don't know is that our industry wants you to believe that when you have a little bit of money, you go buy mutual funds. But when you have a lot of money, you need somebody to help you put those together and move them around because now you have more than one mutual fund. Well, you don't need more than one, but you might have more than one. And all of a sudden you think, God, this is a lot of money. It's, it's scary. It's no more scary. There's no more to know when you've got millions then what you have, nothing. It's the same easy decisions. And let me tell you, that fee for managing that money, that, that when people have a lot of money and they hire a big time money manager to manage it, that fee of 1%, if you pay that to professional managers who manage the mutual fund, who oversee what funds you own because you don't know what funds to own. And they charge 1%. So, okay, the first $6,000, they charge you $60. And then when it's $12,000 under management, they charge you $120. Sounds so innocent. But if you kept that extra 1%. It means you would make an extra 1%. And if you make an extra 1%, that means that you would make an extra, if you assume a 10% return instead of nine over 40 years, you would have an extra almost million dollars at retirement. Ah, at retirement. But then it starts paying you, let's say, forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, and it continues to grow, and you do that for thirty years. It is really a big deal. It's a what I consider to be a million dollar bonus if you will educate your kids, if they will get an education, so that they understand. This, this simple stuff. It is no more complex than what I presented. Yes, there are things, of different things that you can consider, different kind of target date funds. In fact, when you read in my book, I suggest, in fact, it, it, it's a strategy developed by Chris Pedersen, who's the head of research for our foundation, again, a volunteer. But he shows how just the, in, the in, including 10%, in small cap value, target date fund, let them do it all, and just a little 10% down there in small cap value. Oh, you want to go 20? Fine. Want to go 30? Beautiful. Don't have to go past 30. Don't even have to go past 10. But it's going to add probably, the first 10 is going to add a half a percent. And here is another thing that you might teach. I get criticized because, in fact, let me tell you, I don't know if you know who John Bogle is, but he's the guy that started uh, Vanguard Funds. And uh, I had the honor of being with him for 90 minutes in his office in uh, 2017. 
And let me tell you, that guy is, he is one of the most amazing people in the industry of mutual funds, but he started the first index fund and he saved people billions and billions of dollars in fees because he undercut everybody's fees and other people had to come down to meet him at some level. Even the active managers, while they don't charge you the fees that low fees he charges, but they would be charging you more if he wasn't there charging those low fees. And by the way, he recently passed away. But I loved my conversation with him. He changed my life in some ways. But one of the points he made is he was trying to help people have enough and be able to retire in dignity with enough. I believe that enough is not enough. And I really, I really do believe this. And what I mean by this is you and I could plan. We could sit down with a professional planner and say, what's your life going to be like? They never, ever ask, well, how many divorces do you think you'll have, Mr. Merriman? They don't ask that. If they asked that, I'd say, well, I'm not going to have any divorces. I got married at 19 for the first time. Oh, that's right. I wasn't going to have any divorces. But I would never think to build a plan that said, well, I got a plan to have a divorce. No, I didn't. People don't plan being laid off early from whatever their career is. People don't plan the fact that 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 they get a they get a disease that it, that ends up setting them back. Oh yeah, they can still work, but they can't do what they used to do. You can't plan to for everything that might happen. So one thing you could do is say, okay, I need to put away ten percent in order to have what I'm going to need uh, and have enough. And by the way, even having enough, some people, enough is not just to have enough money till they die, but to leave something. Other people want to die the last, they want to run out of money the day they die. That's a hard one to plan for. Actually, it's not so hard because you can end it yourself if you wish. But in theory, that's a very difficult thing to do under normal circumstances. My belief is, and this is what my wife and I decided I wanted to work. And by the way, when I quit, when I retired and started my foundation, I'm working as hard as today as I did when I was working and got paid. But I love it just as much. But the, but, but, but the fact is that we decided to save more than we needed. So that there's a couple things. If bad times came along, we would be protected from that. And the other thing is because we saved more, we could take out more. So when we retired, we were able to do a lot more than most people would be able to do, which for us, the thing that we do the most of that's more is probably give money away, but that's a cost of living. It's just like when we think about those kids who don't get it, that saving is spending. Saving is spending later for stuff that you just can't believe how important it is to you that you can do it. If you actually understood what it was going to feel like to be 65 or 70 or 79 and be able to help people who need help, you would likely give up some of the stuff that we that we buy when we're young, but you can't see that stuff happening. But the one thing we can hopefully uh, start having them think is, is we want to plan for more than we think we need. We want to hope for the best and plan for the worst. And that's what I did during my life, which meant I retired later than, than I would. But having said that, the same is true for these people who are retiring at age 40, who are all part of this FIRE movement. If you don't, if you don't know about it, it's the Financial Independence Retire Early Group. I know a young fellow who saves 70% of everything he makes because he wants to retire early. So he, 
he, I would say to him, save more than you thought you were going to need to retire early. If that means you have to work until you're 42 instead of 40, I would recommend you do that. I'm here to help in any way I can. I cannot be a personal investor. That's one thing I can't do, but I, I, I want to, I want to help all investors, but I can tell you some investors just want somebody to tell them what to do. So you could come to our site and you could look at our recommendations of mutual funds or ETFs. And you could just say, okay, Paul sounded like he knew what he was talking about. And I'm going to invest in those particular mutual funds or ETFs. I really want to try to work with people who want a lot of information. We provide tables, hundreds of tables. We provide, we have over 700 podcasts and articles in total built to try to help people take care of their money. We, we don't manage money. We don't get paid for anything. But we do help you identify the best equity asset classes, how much to put in each one, how much in bonds, depending on your situation, when to move from stocks to bonds, what are the best stock and bond funds, how to take money out of your investments, and how to leave to others. Then the rest is up to you to have the discipline to do it. And by the way, this is not that we know the future. When we tell you, when we show you our 10, our, our 10 best ETFs in different, different kind of mutual funds that we recommend, big, small, value, growth, et cetera, we don't know that they're going to be number one. But we look at all of the factors that we know to research, and we tell you from everything we know, here's what we think will be the best one of the group. That's the best we can do. Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.